And by the way, just uh, Harvest America, it's this coming Sunday, a week from today, uh, at 6 p.m. sharp here at the church. And we are one host site, the only one in the Memphis area. Um, Just put that out there for you. Uh, Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, beginning in verse 15. So Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. (laughs) Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two... Of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Well, then Peter came to him and said, Well, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Huh. Again, the message this morning is entitled Correcting and Forgiving. Now, has anybody here ever heard of the Russian... Bless you. Uh, Everybody say bless you. There you go. Good job. Yeah. If you can't get a blessing in church, where can you? Anybody here heard of the Russian czar, Nicholas Pavlovich I? Anybody heard of Nicholas Pavlovich I? Can anybody pronounce it properly, unlike me? There you go. Well, this guy reigned over Russia as czar, as you can see, from 1825 to 1855. Now, uh, he had quite the large standing army at his disposal. He had appointed the son of a close friend to be the paymaster of his army. But the young man had a gambling problem. And he gambled away not only his own money, but also much of the government's money as well. Well, in due course, the young man received notice that a representative from the czar was coming to check accounts. Well, he knew he was in trouble. So that evening, he got out the books, totaled up the funds that he owed. Then he went to the safe and got out his own pitifully small amount of money. He was overwhelmed as he sat and looked at the astronomical debt versus what he had, which was mere pocket change. He knew he was ruined. Well, to avoid disgrace, 
he decided at the stroke of midnight he would end his own life. Weary with sorrow and remorse, he placed his pistol on the table before him and wrote a summation of his misdeeds. At the bottom of the ledger, where he had totaled up his illegal borrowings, he wrote, Who can pay so great a debt? Well, as the evening wore on, the young soldier grew drowsy and eventually fell asleep. That night, Nicholas I, as sometimes was his custom, made his rounds through the barracks. Seeing a light, he stopped in and saw the young man asleep. Well, he recognized him immediately, and looking over his shoulder, he saw the ledger and all that had taken place. He was about to awaken him and put him under arrest when his eyes fastened on the young man's message, Who can pay so great a debt? Well, a wave of mercy swept over the czar, so he reached over and wrote one word at the bottom of the ledger, And then slipped out. Well, when the young man woke up, he realized that it was long past midnight. And so he reached for his pistol to shoot himself. But his eyes fell upon the ledger. And he saw something that he had not seen before. There written beneath, who can pay so great a debt, was written, Nicholas. Well, he knew without question that it was the czar's signature. And he said to himself, well, the czar must have come in when I was asleep. He's seen the books. He knows all. Still, he is willing to forgive me. The young soldier then rested on the word of the czar. And the next morning, a messenger came from the palace with exactly the amount needed to pay the debt. Now, only the czar could repay, and the czar did pay. Now, this morning... We're going to read about our own crushing debt that we could never pay. But we will discover that there is indeed one who is able to pay for our debt in full. And we're also going to see how he who forgave us so great a debt then expects us to go forth and forgive others who might be indebted to us. So let's look now at verse 15, and uh, if the cell phone has not been turned off back there by the soundboard, would you please do so to eliminate the uh, interference? I'd appreciate that. In uh, verse 15, we read God's guidelines for correcting a sinning saint. God's guidelines for correcting a sinning saint. Begins with verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, So this is a case where somebody has wronged you. You go and post it on Facebook. Go ahead and write everything that you want about that bad person, what they did, because as it says there, Facebook helps you to attack and slander the people you don't like. I think that's their slogan. Now, as you know, sometimes I poke fun about Facebook. And I do know that some people use it very responsibly, And they do find it to be a great blessing. However, with all kidding aside, I've seen the great damage done when Facebook and other social media websites are used in a mean-spirited, evil manner. People writing things they wouldn't dare say to that other person's face. As one wise pastor once said, keep in mind that when you write something on Facebook, others will read it. Others will read it. And they will, therefore, respond and react to it. So please notice that when it comes to an issue you might have with another, nowhere in Scripture, especially in this passage, does the Lord Jesus allow us to post things in a public forum of any sort, and in our day, especially on the Internet. It's not allowable. Notice again in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you know, maybe he didn't know what he had done. You know, one lady told me many years ago when I was a youth pastor, you know, you said something to me two years ago that really hurt my feelings. Two years she had allowed this to fester, and finally she told me about it. And I said, well, I have, I, I, that's not what I meant. What I meant was this, and I'm sorry Can you forgive me for using the wrong words? But please understand, that's not what I meant. She goes, oh, okay, I understand now. 
I said, you poor thing, you've been carrying that for two years. If you just come to me, we could have cleared it up two years ago. And, you know, we do offend one another, sometimes accidentally. And those who are offended need to go to the person and just say, hey, this kind of hurt my feelings. Did you really mean that or was it a mistake? So go tell him the fault alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Go directly to them. Keep it there. And until we deal directly with them, we have no business telling anybody else about that issue. We can't even go and ask outsiders, hey, would you pray for this situation? It's not spiritual. That's gossip. It's Christianized gossip, if you want to call it that. And we're not allowed to do so. It's sin and it's wrong to tell others about a situation before we go to that one person. So we're told here by Jesus to go directly, to also go humbly and lovingly to that person, hoping to just simply clear the matter up and make amends. But, notice verse 16, if he will not hear. Maybe you tell him the fault, hey, this was wrong, you hurt my feelings, and they say, well, so what? I don't care. And I think you're wrong because of all this other stuff. If they're not going to listen to you, then, then take with you one or two more. That by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So in that case, if the person won't listen to you, then bring one or two more. And if those people you brought with you also side with you, then you can rest assured knowing that you're in the right. Because by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Now, what if in that situation, you, you with a couple others go and confront the person and they say, I still don't care what you guys think. You're wrong and I'm right and I don't have to listen to you. Well, notice in verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church... So that's the case where finally it's come to this awful place where you finally broadcast it to the church, to those involved. And, and if, they, if they won't listen, then if he refuses to hear the church, then let him be to like a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, at that point, we disfellowship them. At that point, we say, look, we can't fellowship with you. If you're not in agreement with what we know to be from God, then then we can't hang out anymore. Now, this may say how, or it may sound harsh. It may s- sound very unloving to cut somebody off. But let me say this. It is not loving to give a sinning, rebellious person a soft shoulder to cry on. It's not loving to coddle somebody who is in rebellion to the express will of God. In fact, by so doing... We may be undermining what the Holy Spirit wants to do in that person's heart. Here's the bottom line. If someone won't admit their fault and won't submit to the Lord, then God says that they're out of fellowship with Him. And if they're out of fellowship with God, then they need to be out of fellowship with God's people. This is all part of of church discipline. But it's not a matter of simply kicking somebody out. This is a matter of of trying to correct and restore. This harsh action is part of God's plan to convict that person when they are alone, when they are isolated, when they see that, hey, all of God's people are against them, then maybe they'll begin to think, well, maybe I'm not thinking right. But if they have all the so-called loving, compassionate, Believers come to them, oh, you poor thing, that, that church leadership's so mean, and I, you know, you poor, poor. Then what happens is they get the idea that all the truly loving, gracious, supposedly godly people are on their side, and the bad people are the church. So before we go to comfort somebody who is in outright rebellion, we need to remember what Jesus said, and we need to obey Him in obedience, as hard as it is. And may it never happen. May it never, ever, ever get to this point. But should it ever get to this point, in obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, if a person will not repent, then the church must obey the Lord. 
so that the Holy Spirit can then minister to that person in their isolation and in their loneliness. Verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, and this is, again, in context with the church finally decides, yeah, the person is in sin, they are rebellious, they're not interested in repenting, we got to cut off fellowship, we have to cut ties until they repent. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, many people think that this verse applies to some spiritual, mystical power of binding and loosing. And, I've, uh, you know, you, we hear people from time to time say, you know, I just bind Satan in Jesus' name and I loose the Holy Spirit. And I've prayed that as well. And there may be some validity to that. But in the context of this passage, the binding and loosing is not mystical power. This is a matter of the church agreeing or disagreeing, a matter of the church allowing for or denying a matter of the church coming into agreement with God's predetermined counsel, and then they make a binding proclamation. The Lord has said, have no fellowship, therefore we bind this issue, and we, 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 we send the person out, and we loose that the Holy Spirit would go and minister to their hearts. And so again I say to you, verse 19, if Two or of you agree on earth concerning anything that they that they ask. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And so here we have the church now praying for that person that's in rebellion to God. And we pray for the correction. And we pray for the return of that wayward brother and sister. And by so doing, as we bind and loose in this Context, we can be assured that the Lord is with us and that he will eventually bring them to their senses and hopefully bring them back. Now, let's go back to the beginning when the person first does something against you. When the person first offends you. Let me ask you, how do you feel when somebody offends you? How do you feel when somebody Sins against you. Hurt? You want to strike back? And don't get mad, just get even. You know, is that the attitude? Well, are we allowed to become bitter? Are we allowed to hold a grudge? What if they say, well, you know, you, 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 or you say to them, look, you hurt me and it was wrong. And they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm really sorry. Are you allowed to say, well, you know what? I don't know that I can forgive you. Because what you did was so horrible, so awful. What you did hurt me so deeply. I don't know if, you, if I could ever forgive you. Are we allowed to do that? On well, verses 21 through 25, we read that unforgivers will be tortured. So apparently we're not allowed to do that. Unforgivers will be tortured. Verse 21. Peter came to him and said, Lord... And again, it's in, it, it's in the context of the correcting the sinning brother and the brother that sins against you. Well, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter at least understood that Jesus wasn't talking about punishing somebody who sins, but about correcting and restoring. Peter also knew that someone might say to him, oh, well, Peter, you're right, and so please forgive me. But then that rascal go out and do the same thing to him again and again and again. At some point, we might begin to question that person's sincerity. You say, yeah, forgive me, but I don't think you're being honest. What do we do? Peter asks this great question. It is a great question. A repeat offender. How many times do I have to forgive a repeat offender? Now, Peter suggested up to seven times. The religious rulers of the Jews in his day taught that you only had to forgive somebody three times. And then the fourth time, you could go ahead and bust them in the nose. I think I'll keep that picture up there for the entire remaining of the message just because it's so cute. I like to look on the kid bopping the other one in the nose. That's just, that's awesome right there. 
you know, oh, I'm gonna, it's like Mike Tyson's spirit came over him. And so up to seven times, Peter doubled the religious rulers who said three times, and then he added one for good measure, thinking maybe Jesus would be so impressed. Wow, Peter, you're really grasping the heart of this forgiveness and restoration deal. Good job, Pete. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, let me point out, is it possible to restore fellowship, to forgive and then restore fellowship with somebody who does not want to be forgiven, does not want to be restored? Is it possible to make them get restored with you? No, it's not possible. The Bible says as much as depends upon you, be at peace with all people. So in the instance where somebody, you go to somebody and say, hey, you, you hurt my feelings, you offended me, this is what you did, and they look at you and say, too bad. Can you at that time say, well, I forgive you, let's have restored fellowship? No. Can't, they don't want fellowship with you. And so at that point, you're left with the, the one option of simply forgiving them from your heart. To not let their sin hold you captive. Have a grip on your heart. And as we'll read later on, Jesus commands us to forgive people, at least from our hearts. But in this situation, it's a man that, or a woman who has done something against you, and you confront them, and they say, I'm sorry, forgive me, and you do so. And then they do the same thing again, and you confront them again. Oh, man, I'm sorry again. Please forgive me. And this happens several times. Jesus said 70 times 7. Now, for you math whizzes, that's what? 490 times. So on the 491st time, then you... No, that's not what he's saying here. No, Jesus' point is that we keep on forgiving no matter how many times a person sins against us. Now, I know what you're thinking. Same thing I'm thinking. Now, wait. Wait a second. If they keep sinning against me the same thing over and over again, they obviously don't care about me. They're obviously using me. They obviously are just simply walking all over me. You don't expect me to be walked over like that, do you? Certainly Jesus doesn't ask me to be a doormat to just forgive and try to forget every single time. Well, before we adopt such a mindset, let's remember this biblical truth. All of us are also repeat offenders. The same thing over and over again, not just to one another, but ultimately against the Lord. Now, Jesus always forgives us of our repeat offenses, doesn't he? If we come to him humbly and sorrowfully and asking him to, for forgiveness, does he not forgive our repeat offenses? Well, if he does that, then he expects us to do the same for others, which he clearly states in this next parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. You know, in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, we read, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Each of us will have a day before the Lord, individually, where we give an account of everything we've done, everything we've said and everything we've thought. Now, I don't want to explain away that verse and try to make it softer than it is. I don't want to add to it either and make it harsher than what it is. We do read in 1 Corinthians about all of our deeds as believers go through the fire and wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up and whatever remains gold, silver, precious stones, the reward will be ours in heaven. And that is true. However, however, I don't, I would rather not have to answer for a bunch of misdeeds, misthoughts, 
misactions. And I do understand there is going to be an accounting day for John Pillaban, as there will be for you as well. So the certain king, Jesus is telling this parable, wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when they had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. In modern day currency, that's about a bajillion. It is a huge, almost half the national debt. It is a huge, a huge amount that none of us could even begin to pay. But he was not able. This guy who owed the master a bajillion dollars. And so his master commanded that he be sold, sold into slavery, he and his wife and children and all that he had in the payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all. That's a nice gesture. But those were empty words because the master and and he himself knew he could never repay it. Way beyond what he could repay. Just like that man, the paymaster, young man, in the story earlier, the true story about Nicholas I, so great a debt, who can repay? That was this man's situation. Well, he falls down before the master, and the master of that servant, verse 27, was moved with compassion, released him, forgave him the debt. Wow. Try to imagine how you would feel if you had this massive crushing debt you knew you could never repay and bankruptcy wasn't an option, you just had to repay it. And you, so you call all the nice, gracious, benevolent people at MasterCard and you tell them your story and they say, you know what, this is a special day. I have the authority for one person to just forgive all their debt. And so I'm going to do that for you. Right now, tippity-tippity, your debt is now gone. Look online if you wish and you go online and your account and there are your balances, zero. How would you feel? Keep in mind, this is a feeling that every born-again believer in Jesus Christ has felt and will feel throughout all eternity. Our debt, so great, there was no way we could even begin to pay for our sins. The Bible declares that we are dead in our sins and in our trespasses. Now, the last time I checked, dead people cannot earn money. Dead people cannot earn a living. Get it? Dead can't earn a living. Uh, Okay, work with me, please. In fact, dead people can't even pay their debts. It's impossible for them. They can't earn the money to pay their debts. They're dead. (laughs) Now, sometimes when people die, they leave their debts to their children, which is interesting. But the point of this parable, the main point is this. Number one, Our debt of sin totaled into the bajillions. Number two, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Therefore, we were incapable of paying for our sins. But Jesus, our master, forgave us our debt of sin because he paid for it himself. He paid for it himself which he did by taking our place in judgment on the cross and then rising from the dead three days later. Now, knowing that Jesus paid for your debt of sin in full, has freely forgiven you of everything, including should you sin in the future, should you fall and stumble in the future, those sins are forgiven as well. How do you feel? How do you feel about that? I'm sure you feel very grateful. I'm sure you're very glad. I'm sure like me, you want to wipe your forehead and go, whew, at the very least. But how do you feel now about others who have wronged you? And the massive debt of sin that we, we did toward Jesus, he's forgiven it all. Now, how do you feel? You have been forgiven. How do you feel toward those who have wronged you? Notice how the forgiven servant in this parable treated somebody else who owed him. Verse 28. 
But that servant, after he'd just been forgiven a bajillion dollars, he's like, yes, I'm free. Oh, wait, look, there's Irving, for lack of a better name. There's Irving. He owes me some money. Irving, come over here. He went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. Now, denarii is a plural, plural of denarius. A denarius was a, the day's wages for a common laborer. So that man, Irving, owed the forgiven man a hundred days' wages. And that's a decent sum of money. But it was nothing compared to the debt that that forgiven person had just had written off. Nothing compared to what he had owed. This other guy owed him nothing compared to what he had owed the master. Yes, people do us wrong. Be honest, we do people wrong. But in the course of life, people do us wrong. But it's nothing compared to the wrong that we've done to Jesus. And to become angry and bitter and unforgiving toward others who wrong us reveals something very wrong within us. An unforgiving spirit that is totally antagonistic to the heart of God. So the forgiven man grabbed the second man, Irving, by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. Well, his fellow servant, verse 29, fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And by the way, this was a debt that that Irving guy could have in the course of time paid back. It was a reasonable debt. If only he had a little bit of patience, a little grace period, he could have repaid it. But the first guy, the forgiven servant, would not. He would not allow him to have time, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, when his fellow servants had saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came and told their master all that had been done. So, (laughs) if you find yourself bitter and unforgiving towards somebody, do not be surprised to find out that others will begin praying for you. They will go to the master in prayer and rat on you. Because unforgiveness is something that the Holy Spirit wants to rid from the church. Wants to weed it out, root it out, get rid of it once and for all. And if there's bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart, do not be surprised if the master calls you in calls you onto the carpet notice verse 32 then his master after he had called him said you wicked servant i forgave you all that debt because you begged me should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as i had pity on him what do people owe you right now is there somebody who owes you something compare that to what you owe god Compare what others owe you in light of what you owe God. Remember, it's nothing. Nothing compared to what we owe the Lord. Therefore, to not forgive them is going to bring forth the heavy hand of God upon ourselves. Notice in verse 34, his master was angry. Delivered him to the torturers. Oh, that's a scary word right there. The tormentors, the torturers. What are the torturers? What are the tormentors? I don't exactly know. But I do know this. I don't want to come under their authority. I do not want them messing with me. He delivered him over to the torturers till he should pay all that was due him. So my head, listen, so because the the master in the parable did this, Jesus isn't just giving a scary story. He's, He's backing it up with a promise. Not necessarily one of the precious promises you put on your refrigerator but nonetheless a promise of God. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, deliver you to the torturers, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. If I have unforgiveness in my heart, I'm going to be delivered to the torturers. I don't know exactly what that means, but I guarantee this, it will be no fun. It will be awful until finally I'm broken and become forgiving. Until I'm broken 
and become humble enough to realize that God forgave me a massive debt of sin I could never begin to pay. Who am I to hold a grudge against anybody else? You know, within the body of Christ, sadly, you can tell the people who are not forgiving people, they're tortured souls. Tortured souls, even within the body of Christ. Why? They're not forgiving. They're holding a grudge. They fail to realize how much God has forgiven them and they're not willing to extend that same grace to others. So God will keep them imprisoned, suffering at the hand of the torturers until they finally let go of their bitterness and forgive others the debt that, again, is nothing compared to the debt that we all owe the Lord. In Hebrews 12, verse 15, we read, Looking carefully, be careful of this. Very serious here. Be very, very careful lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And that looking carefully, picture in your mind somebody trying to cross a a shallow but yet dangerous stream with rocks, and he's trying to be very careful where he or she is stepping so that they don't fall in. Look carefully. There's some treacherous steps out there concerning this issue of forgiving and not forgiving. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Sadly, when one person is unforgiving, that root of bitterness, it's, it's, it's like a weed that has its, its roots that go out and then spring up in other places. You know those weeds, don't you? Hate them. You know, you try to keep a nice lawn and you got one weed here you think you got done and then another one pops up over there. Because under the surface, those roots spread out and they pop up in other places. Well, a person who is unforgiving, a person who is bitter, under the surface, those bitter roots spread out and they then begin to infect their family. And they then begin to infect the church. They... In, begin to infect their co-workers. It spreads out. It is a cancer that God says we have got to root out or we will remain tortured and then make life miserable for everybody around us. May God free us from any unforgiving spirit that we would seek restoration, not another's destruction that we might be gracious to others as God has been gracious to us so that we can avoid the cruel treatment of the torturers. Shall we pray? Father, there's some heavy, heavy, heavy stuff in here, Lord. And Lord Jesus, you said these things for a reason. And what was true back then, there were people who were unforgiving, is true today. And so, Lord, I do pray that for any of us here this morning who, who, who maybe have that root of bitterness, who are angry maybe at their spouses or at their children or at their parents or at some school teacher from the past or, or somebody on the job or, or even somebody here at the church, Lord, and they purposefully sit on the other side of the church as to avoid contact with them. Lord, this has happened and it's so sad. And Lord, I pray that you would literally put the fear of God in us to do all that we can to avoid the treatment of the torturers. And so, Lord, if there's anybody in that category here this morning, we want to get rid of it. We want to have you root it out of us. And, Lord, it, it, cause, it, it requires that we be, ad, be willing to admit it, that we be willing to come clean of it, that we would even say before our brothers and sisters in Christ, you know what, I, I'm not forgiving. I'm the culprit here. I'm tortured and I want to be free. And Lord, I know you're speaking to people's hearts today and I know that you're willing and able and wanting to deliver people from bitterness, from unforgiveness. It's something you want to do and if we will meet you where you are, I know that the power of the Holy Spirit will be sufficient to rid us of this unforgiving thing, this cancer that's destroying us and the body of Christ and our families as well. And while we're all praying, if you feel that the Lord is speaking to you about unforgiveness and you're holding a grudge and you can't stand that person because of what they've done and you're ready for the Lord to take it away, would you stand up right now so that the rest of us can pray with you and agree with you? 
Will you stand up right now before God and say, you know what, that's me, and I don't want to hide it anymore. I'm ruining myself and others around me, so I want to be free of this. If you want to be free of that unforgiveness, will you please stand up right now? Right now. Well, Lord, I guess this may apply to somebody listening to this on the Internet. Or maybe somebody, Lord, who downloads the podcast. Or somebody here, Lord, who uh, does not feel comfortable standing up in front of us. And I understand, Lord, that is embarrassing. And so, Lord, I do pray for myself. That where there is unforgiveness, where is that holding a grudge, even if it's a little thing, a little grudge, Lord, is still way too big. And so, God, please take it from me. And Lord, wherever this is true of any of us, would you please take it from us, O Lord? So great a debt, who can repay? And at the bottom of our ledger, you have written your name in blood, the name of Jesus. You did pay. Therefore, Lord, help us to be glad in you and quick to forgive others. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Shall we stand for a closing song?